I'm Andrew Levine, the CEO of Coinos Group, where our mission is to help people leverage blockchain to benefit humanity. So when we saw that one of the most rapidly growing blockchains in the space, Solana, was down for 17 whole hours, we decided to do some research into that protocol to understand what went wrong because that's a long time for over $40 billion in value to be inaccessible, even if you call yourself a beta. But keep in mind that just because we're looking at a negative event, that doesn't mean that we're condemning the entire project. It just means that when things break, those breakages often reveal interesting details about a project and their design decisions. Whatever went wrong with Solana, we don't want to go wrong with our blockchain. And if in the course of our investigations, we can also learn about what a project like Solana is doing right and then leverage that information to our benefit as well, then all the better. My conversation today is with one of my co-founders, Michael Vandenberg, who's one of the blockchain architects building Coinos. He's going to share his findings from the little bit of research he did in his ample spare time. Uh, but just remember, the value here is not based on Michael being an expert on Solana, which he's not. He's an expert on building blockchains. And so the potential value in this conversation stems from his perspective as someone who builds blockchains, again, not as a Solana expert. Michael, I think a good place to start would be on this idea of a cryptographic clock. A lot of people don't seem to realize that according to the people behind Solana, the innovation at the core of that blockchain is what they call proof of history, but which is essentially a clock, a cryptographic clock. Their central claim seems to be that by building a separate system alongside the blockchain that allows people who are running nodes to know what time a transaction was submitted to the network, this somehow allows them to achieve the high transactions per second number that they've been advertising. I think one thing people might be interested to know is that as insiders within the space, this is not a common view of this problem, or at least it wasn't before Solana. By which I mean, it's not like there was this widespread concern within the blockchain space that without a cryptographic clock, we'd never be able to achieve high transaction throughput. In other words, there was no consensus that the key to improving throughput was adding a clock to the blockchain. I did a little bit of digging in because I was trying to understand this cryptographic clock idea, how Solana is doing what they're doing and the drawbacks to the approach. So the cryptographic clock is relying on what are called verifiable delay functions. Um, so essentially the idea is, what if I had a hash function that I could guarantee took some amount of wall clock time to compute, but then could be verified instantly? So essentially, if, if I had one, then I could just chain these back to back to back to back using the output from one as the input to the other. And then knowing that if I started at a certain amount period and point in time, and then I gave you a proof that said, hey, so, okay. So essentially now I, I'm doing this and I'm generating them. And so I've got hash after hash after hash after hash. Essentially, similarly to how a blockchain works, I can guarantee based on simply the fact that I am hashing and generating these, that time is passing, right? So on blockchain, we, it's being slowed down by the difficulty of the proof of work. On this one, essentially, it's being slowed down by the nature of the hash function itself. Does, does that piece make sense? Yeah. Okay. So now, essentially, I can use that as a clock because every single point in time, every single hash represents a point in time. And so if I reference to that point in time with a transaction, then I, I can guarantee that, hey, I, I can cryptographically show this transaction had existed prior to this, after this point in time. And then, you, they've designed the hash function in such a way that I can then also point back to arbitrary data. So I can have a transaction that references a point in the clock and then a later point in the clock that references back to that transaction. And now I create an interval where on the one side, I say this transaction for sure existed 
after this hash, I guess backwards for you, right? Existed after this hash, right? And now uh, the clock says it existed prior to this hash. And so I now have an interval that actually corresponds to wall clock time as to when that transaction um, was created. You know, but after this time, before this time. So that's kind of cool, I guess, right? And, and the benefit of it is they say they're using a high frequency the uh, verifiable delay function. In fact, I believe the the ver the verifiable delay function that they're using is just a SHA two fifty six hash. Um, but the way like and it's I would say it's a very loose interpretation of the actual crypt like cryptography that people are trying to do with this. But essentially, what they're doing is if I can create a bunch of hashes like where the output of one is the input to the next, that cannot be parallelized because I have to complete a hash in order to complete the next hash in order to complete the next hash. But if you give me thousands of hashes and say, hey, were these built off each other? I can, I can in parallel, because now I've got all the inputs, hash everything at once and verify it. So over time, it's, they're, they're essentially doing all the verification on a GPU and the generation on a CPU. They're just using this chain of hashes as a quote unquote clock. Um, and then I'm assuming, and this is, this is, there's a couple of assumptions I'm making of like, how would I try to make this work? Because as soon as a, a, the clock references back to a transaction, well, now that clock is from that point on differs from everybody else's clock. So I'm, what I'm assuming is happening is each node is running its own clock constantly and then is adding transactions to its own clock and then shipping these proofs around the network. And so essentially, even prior to transactions being included in a block, you can have a high degree of certainty of their ordering. Um, and their inclusion or exclusion. And then blocks, I believe, would, would be, exist for two point reasons. The first would be, um, you're running your clock, I'm running my clock, we're sending transactions back and forth, everything's being decorated, there's these massive, and by the way, these proofs would be massive. I think this is one of the reasons why their, their uh, resource requirements are so high, because Either the proofs are, okay, so I'll, I'll get back to that. But these proofs, these transactions are all being shuffled back and forth. And um, it's, it's uh, you can with very quickly, to a high degree of certainty, know what transactions should be included in what order prior to a block being created. And then the purpose of a block is to collate all those transactions into the the, the official ordering, but that's essentially depended. It's, it's already sort of been determined cryptographically what it should be using this clock, but it packages them together. And then I believe also serves to reset everybody's clocks together. Like it, it's a, it's a, you run it for a little bit, everybody's is going to diverge because every node is getting different transactions at different times. But the point is, it doesn't matter that the clocks diverge because the proofs still um, the proofs still validate the timings, and then blocks serve to reset those clocks, probably delayed. So I imagine nodes are probably running like three or four of these clocks at a, clocks at a time. Um, it doesn't actually matter, except that they would diverge too much over time. So I'm guessing blocks serve to reset that, um, and then sort of officially finalized transactions. However, um, transaction latency would likely be very, very low. Um, in order to get this theoretic transaction throughput that they're specifying, um, they, they would have to be running a very, very high frequency hash clock. My guess is probably as fast as their hardware will allow them to, which means they've got one CPU core that is doing nothing but SHA-256. Um, and even in like on their website, 
they they mention like both AMD and Intel's newest processors can do a full SHA-256 um, hash in like 1.75 cycles or something like that. So essentially, if you've got a five gigahertz um, uh, processor, you're roughly like, you're roughly doing uh, like two and a half billion hashes a second. Effectively now you, you that frequency um, is essentially the maximum number of transactions cryptographically that can be handled. The, the reason that is important is because if you don't have a high enough frequency, uh, it's possible that transactions could collide on a on a on one particular time. And I don't think that this cryptographic scheme hand, would handle collisions well because a collision would lead to um, a potential reordering. Like if two transactions exist at the same time, you don't know how to order those transactions. So you need to have a high frequency in order to disambiguate that as, as much as possible. Even still, I don't think you can totally prevent um, that level of ambiguity. Uh, simply from the moment I generate a transaction to the moment your node receives it, there's some latency and that's that little window and those windows could overlap. Um, and you could probably figure out a, a reasonable heuristic to sort those out, but it wouldn't be guaranteed. The challenge though is the faster your clock, your sort of your, your clock frequency is, this cryptographic clock, um, the larger the proofs are because you have to validate um, every single step along. Um, thankfully, you, you, like I said, you can validate that in parallel, but if you are running this as theoretically as fast as possible, yes, you're creating uh, like 2.5 billion um, hashes per second, but those are also 256 bit hashes. So you're roughly creating uh, over 500 gigabytes of data per second. Uh, you're muted again. That time intentionally. Um, okay, that's a lot. So, so presumably it's so not cumulative, they're, but- Yeah, they're not, well, they're not running that fast, obviously that's, but the, it now means, um, from a theoretic perspective, uh, your assuming transactions were just even quote unquote free, um, in order to order them using this scheme, your transaction potential transaction throughput is a function of your RAM. Meaning the more RAM you have and the higher uh, throughput that RAM has, Cryptographically speaking, you could have a higher transaction throughput. Um, so, like, the cryptography of it makes sense to me, and I and I think they're pushing for these massively massive requirements on nodes uh, because of the, this cryptographic scheme links those scheme links those together. So. I don't think, so I guess, long story short, I don't think it has direct applications to what we're doing. Certainly we could maybe try to implement something like that, but I, I think, um, well, and, and certainly actually something like that could be implemented. I, th I think it would take a little bit of work, but I don't know if it's necessarily like actually all that valuable. Yeah, that was kind of, that was going to be my, my question here, you know, um, could you, could you dig into that? Why, why wouldn't it be valuable? Is this smoke and mirrors? Is this them basically doing, is this backing up kind of our previous thesis that what they're really doing here is requiring, uh, inaccessible hardware requiring like very high grade hardware and designing a highly optimized system around maximizing around a specific metric. Yeah. And so I think, 
the, there is, um, I think there's one type of user that actually would care about what Solana is doing. And granted, there is a lot of these types of users, but I think there's only one and that is uh, DeFi. FTX maybe? <laughs> Essentially, it's, um, yeah, it, having, being able to reach a very quick, um, be, being able to very quickly determine what the transaction ordering is, even prior to being included in a block, is very advantageous for trading. Because you can ship transactions and you can react to transactions before they're even like essentially you can you can be following what's going on in the mempool and be acting on trades that have not been yet included in blocks because you have such a high degree of certainty that they will be included and in a particular order. So while you your quote unquote maybe time to finality is no better than most other blockchains, there's a higher degree of certainty prior to finality that I think from a business perspective could still be considered actionable information. Um, other than that, like I don't, like you do not need proof of history to enable high transaction throughput. Um, I, I just, I don't think you, I don't think, well, maybe, maybe not. Like I think it helps, but I don't think it's helping to the order of magnitude that they're saying it is. The advantage is if you've got a high degree of certainty of the order of transactions, then you can then your node could actually begin processing those transactions prior to receiving a block. So the block itself is really just confirmation of the thing you already know. You receive a block and it confirms essentially what you already know with a high degree of certainty. That certainty would decrease as more nodes were added to the network. They say, uh, for cost purposes, we are only running a handful of nodes. However, we have spun it up on many instances to over, okay, so they're only running a few right now, but it looks like in their testing for a short period of time, they did run it on 200 physically distinct nodes across 23 data centers on AWS, Google, Google Cloud, and Azure for benchmarking but they're only running a few nodes. You think about it this way. I think I've got all these transactions and I'm beginning to apply them and I get a block. Well, what if that block contains a transaction that I don't have or doesn't contain a transaction that I think it should have? I've got to unwind to the point where I disagree and then apply the transactions from the block. But if the block agrees with me, I already applied those transactions. And so I effectively have a block application time of zero, which is fantastic. But the more nodes that are in the network, the higher the probability that I will have a collision or I will have a problem with that block, that it will either have a transaction that I never heard of for whatever reason, or it's missing a transaction that I think it should have. In a weird way, the bigger their network, the lower their effective TPS. So having a, a network that ha purposely has an extraordinarily high barrier to entry and runs relatively fewer nodes ensures that they will have a high TPS.